The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Uh, last lecture, I did a, a, a fairly standard treatment of the harmonic oscillator which is not supposed to make you excited, but just to see that you can do this. And the, the, the path to the solution was to define dimensionless position coordinate. And then you get a dimensionless Schrodinger equation. And uh, the solution of that involves two steps. One is to uh, insist that the, function, the uh, solutions to the, this Schrodinger equation have an exponentially damped form. And then the Schrodinger equation is transformed into a new equation called the Hermite uh, equation. And uh, you shouldn't get all excited about that. The mathematicians take care of it. And, and so the solutions to this Hermite uh, differential equation gives you a set of orthogonal and normalized wave functions. They give you the energy levels expressed as a quantum number plus a half times constant. The energy levels the, uh, with the quantum number v uh, are even or odd in v, and they're even or odd in psi. The even v and corresponds to even psi. v is the number of internal nodes. And there are all sorts of things you can do, do to say, well, I expect if I know how to do certain things in classical mechanics, they're going to come out pretty much the same way in quantum mechanics. So that's the standard structure. But more importantly, I want you to have in your head the pictures of the wave functions, the idea that there is a zero point energy and that, that the, the, there's a reason for that, that the wave functions have tails extending out into the non-classical or the for classically forbidden region. And this turns out to be the beginning of tunneling. You'll, you'll be looking at tunneling more, more specifically. We also, I also want you to know how the spacing of nodes is. And that involves generalization of the um, de Broglie idea that the wavelength is h over p. But if the potential is not constant, then p is a function of x. This is not the classical the quantum mechanical operator. This is a function which provides you with a lot of in, uh, intuition. And then if you know where the node spacings are and you know the, uh, envelope, the shape of the envelope, you have basically everything you need to have a classical sense of what's going on. And then, I guess it's mostly hidden, I did a little bit of semi-classical theory, and I showed that if you integrate from the left turning point to the right turning point at a given energy of this momentum function, you get h over 2 times the number of nodes. And this is the semi-classical quantization. It's incredibly important, and it's, it's useful either as an exact or an approximate result for all one-dimensional problems. And so it tells you how to, how to begin. Now, before I start talking about what we're going to do today, I want to stress where we're going. So we're going to be looking at some exactly solved problems. And so we have the particle in a box, the harmonic oscillator, the hydrogen atom yet to come, and the rigid rotor. Now all of these problems have an infinite number of eigenfunctions, an infinite number of energy levels. And um, that's intimidating, but it's true. Now, this, these infinite number of functions are explicit functions of the quantum number. 
And so we have an infinite number. But in order to describe systems, we're going to be calculating integrals. We're going to be calculating a lot of integrals between these infinite number of functions. So we have an infinity squared of integrals. Well, that shouldn't scare you because what, you, what I'm going to show you is that all of the integrals that we are going to encounter are explicit functions of the quantum numbers. And they have rel relatively selection rules. In other words, which integrals are non-zero based on the difference in quantum numbers between the left-hand side and the right-hand side. So we're collecting these things in order to calculate a whole bunch of stuff. And I told you that this is a course for use rather than philosophy or history. And so if you encounter any quantum mechanical problem, you'd like to be able to uh, uh, describe what you could observe with it. And so if you're armed with the infinite number of uh, energy levels and uh, eigen solutions for a problem, you can calculate any property. So you define some property you're interested in. There is a quantum mechanical operator that corresponds to that property. And in order to be able to describe uh, observations of that property, <clears throat> you need to calculate integrals of that operator. Well, la -dee -da, that's that should be intimidating, but it's not. Because almost all of these integrals <clears throat> can be expressed as a simple constant times a function of the quantum number or the difference in quantum numbers. And that's, that, that's a fantastic thing. We can also, so we have any operator. We have, uh, suppose the Hamiltonian is an exactly solved problem plus something else, which we'll call H1. And this is, this is a complexity in the, or it's the reality in the problem. And in order to, uh, to d deal with this, again, you're going to need to calculate integrals of this operator. And the last thing that's really going to be exciting is once we do the time, once we look at the time dependent Schrodinger equation, we're going to get wave packets. And these are functions of position and time. And these wave packets are classical-like localized objects that move following the Newton's equations of motion for the center of the wave packet. And again, there are a whole bunch of integrals you're going to need in order to do these things. And so right now, we're starting with the best problem for these integrals because the harmonic oscillator has some special properties. And the lecture notes are incredibly tedious and they're mostly proofs, and I'm going to try to go fast over the, the, uh, the tedious stuff and uh, uh, give you the important ideas. But since there is some important logic, you should really look at these notes. Okay, so what we're going to be doing today is we start with the co uh, coordinate momentum operators. We're going to get The, these operators in dimensionless form. And then we're going to get these A and A dagger guys. And this, so this step is re reminiscent of what I did at the beginning of the previous lecture. And then this is magic. Because this magic enables you to just look at integrals and say, I know that integral is zero, or I know that integral is not zero. And with a little bit more effort, maybe something that you put on the back of a postage stamp, you can evaluate that integral. Not by knowing integral tables, but by knowing the properties of these simple little A and A dagger. And that's a fantastic thing. And it's so fantastic that this is one of the reasons why almost all problems 
in quantum mechanics start with a harmonic oscillator approximation because there is so much you can do with this A and A dagger formalism. Now, at the beginning, I also told you that in quantum mechanics, the important thing that contains everything we're allowed to know about a system is the wave function. But I also told you we can never measure the wave function. We can never experimentally determine it. And so we need to be able to calculate what this wave function uh, does as far as what we can observe. And these A's and A daggers are really important in being able to do that. OK, so I'm going to start with covering what I did in the notes. But I'm going to jump to final results at some point governed by the clock. And so the first thing we're going to do is these. And so what we do is we define uh, the relationship between the ordinary position coordinate and This little twiddle means it's dimensionless. And uh, so we can write the inverse of that. And that's the one we, we are going to want to, well, actually, we go both ways. OK, and we do the same thing for the momentum. P is equal to h bar mu omega square root p twiddle and the, the inverse, but which I don't need to write. And finally, we get the Hamiltonian, which is p squared over 2 mu plus 1 half k x squared. And we'll put that into these new units. So we have h bar mu omega over 2 mu p twiddle squared plus k over 2. Now this is all very tedious, but the, the payoff is very soon. Uh, uh, k over 2 times h bar mu omega x twiddles squared. Well, isn't that interesting? We, we can combine, uh, we, we can absorb a k over mu in omega, and so we get actually a, a big simplification. We get h bar omega over 2 times p twiddle squared plus x twiddle squared. Well, that's a, that looks simpler. OK, and so the next thing we do is it looks like a simple, uh, simple problem from algebra. Let's factor this. Now, it's a little tricky because you know you, you, know you could factor something in real terms if this is a minus sign. But we are, are allowed to talk about complex quantities. And so we can, we can factor that. And so this term, p twiddle squared plus x twiddle squared is equal to i p twiddle plus x twiddle times minus i p twiddle plus x OK, and you can work that out, that IP times I minus IP is P squared, and X times X is X squared. And then we have these cross terms, IP times X, and X times minus IP. Whoops. They don't commute. If this were algebra, well, they would go away. But they don't. And so what you end up getting is uh, uh, p twiddle squared plus x twiddle 
squared plus i times b I'm going to st stop writing the twiddles. Okay, so we have this. I want to make sure that I haven't sabotaged myself. That's going to be, yeah, that's right. Okay, so we have something here that isn't zero. It looks like I times the commutator of P twiddle with X twiddle. Well, we can work that out because we know the commutator of P ordinary with X ordinary. And so I did that. And uh, so we have this commutator, P twiddle, X twiddle. After some algebra, we get plus 1. A number, a pure number. No, I want you to check my algebra. Uh, so you just substitute in uh, uh, what this is in terms of ordinary p and the ordinary x. Use the commutator for ordinary xp, which is ih bar, and magically you get plus one. So this. Very strange and boring derivation says, okay, uh, well, let's, okay, and let's now give these two things names. Okay, this guy we're going to call as a, as a square root of two times a, and this one is going to be the square root of two times a dagger. So, H is going to be H bar omega over 2 times square root of 2 A hat times square root of 2 A dagger hat minus 1. Remember, when we factored it, we got this extra term, which was 1. And in order to make it correct, we have to subtract it away. Okay, and so this becomes h bar omega a hat a dagger hat minus a half. Well, isn't that nice? Now we have the Hamiltonian expressed as a constant, which we know is important because it's related to the energy levels, and times these two little things, which turn out to be the gift from God. It's, it's an incredible thing what these do. Okay. So we have gone through some algebra and we know the relationship between A and the X and P twiddles and, we, and similarly for A dagger and we can go in the other direction and we know the commutator and now we're going to start doing some really great stuff. Okay, well, one thing we're going to want to know about is a hat, a hat, a dagger, that commutator hat. And that turns out to be, well, I already did, I already derived it. It, it turns out to be plus one. And as a result, we can say things like this, a, a dagger, um, So using this trick, 
we can show, we can always replace uh, something like uh, A, A dagger by A dagger A plus this commutator, which is one. And so we have this really neat way of reversing the order of the A's and A daggers. So with this, we're going to soon discover that A operating on the eigenfunction gives square root of V times psi V minus 1, and A dagger operating on this one wave function gives V plus 1 square root psi V plus 1, which is the reason these things are valuable. Because if you have any, any eigenfunction, you can get all of the others. So suppose you have the lowest eigenfunction. You apply a dagger on it as many times as you need to get to, say, the vth function. So you don't actually, you're not going to be evaluating integrals. You're be going to be counting a's and a daggers and permuting them around and getting ones and stuff like that. Yes? Uh, in this line with the commutator, you didn't move the dagger. I didn't what? A, 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 commutator yeah. a, a dagger plus a dagger a should be a, a dagger. And, and on the right hand side, you need to move the dagger. Okay, so this is to switch the order, and I've done that. And that then is no. I think. Wait a second. Okay, so we have a a dagger. So that's a a a dagger minus a dagger a, and that's oh yeah. Thank you. It's very very easy to get lost, and once you you're lost, you you can never be found because you've made a mistake that's built into your logic and you're never going to see it. You see, it took me a couple of minutes to even accept the, the, the insight from my TA who's sitting there calmly thinking, and I'm trying to do several things in addition to think. OK, so we, we can do things like this. Suppose we have psi, I can't use this notation yet. So suppose we have psi star v, and we have a dagger a dagger, a dagger, psi, v prime, dx. OK, these are raising operators. So this is going to take v, to, uh, v prime to v prime plus 3. Those are the, that's the only integral that's 0, not 0. And we get v prime plus 1 v prime plus 2, v prime plus 3, square root, as the constants. And this will be v prime plus 3. So that, you know, instead of evaluating an integral, looking at what the x's and p's are, we, we, we just have a little game we play. OK, so now we have to prove some of the things I've said. So we have h, and we're going to operate on a dagger psi v. So what does the Hamiltonian do to this thing? So what we're going to want to do is to, to show that this thing is an eigenvalue, eigenfunction of v plus 1. And that's what we are going to get. So let's just go through this. So we have h bar omega a dagger a plus a half times psi v. So what I did is. Where did I? Yeah, I showed that 
the Hamiltonian. Or did I not do that yet? Oh yeah, I did it right here. The Hamiltonian is h bar omega a, da a, a dagger minus a half. Or if we reverse these, it's equal to h bar omega a dagger a plus a half. So we can use either one. So I'm using that one. And um, <clears throat> so, except I wanted an A dagger here, OK? Because we want to show what the Hamiltonian does to this. OK, now, we can pull an A dagger out to the right, right? Because this. Uh, Uh, the half times a dagger, well, that doesn't matter. This a dagger, a, a dagger, well, we can pull this a dagger out. So we have h bar omega a dagger is equal to a, a dagger plus one half psi v. Now, we use our magic commutator trick to replace this by a dagger a plus 1. OK, so now we have h bar omega a dagger. And we have a dagger a plus 3 halves psi v. Well, this is uh, ev plus h bar omega. We've increased the uh, number that started here. Here is EV. That was EV plus 1. And so now we have no operators in here. And we can stick the A dagger back here. And so we have H bar omega EV plus 1 A dagger Well, what do we have here? We have an operator. We have this function. We have some constant times the same function. So what we've shown is that this thing is an eigenfunction of the Hamiltonian that belongs to the eigenvalue EV plus 1. We've increased the energy by 1. So what we have so so we can show that we apply a dagger to any function we increase its energy And we can do this forever. We could also do a similar thing if we apply a to psi v. We can go down. But at some point, we run out of steam because we've gone, gone to the lowest energy. And if we go lower, we get 0. We get, so a operating on psi min gives 0. So we have this stack of uh, uh, energy levels and wave functions. And we have the same stack being repeated as we go down. But this one has an end.
Okay. So we bring back what A is. And so A time in is zero. That's the equation. We bring in what A min is. It's I mean but what A is, and it's I P twiddle X plus X twiddle. So we do some algebra, and what we end up with is a differential equation, psi min dx twiddle is equal to, again, a little bit more algebra, minus mu omega over h bar times psi min. So what function uh, gives, uh, there's an x in here too. So what function has a derivative, which is the function you had started with times the variable times a constant? Okay, and so the answer to that is that psi min has to have the form, some normalization factor, times e to the minus m omega, or mu omega, sorry, mu, over 2h bar x squared, a Gaussian. Well, it had to be a Gaussian, right? We know when we did the algebra that we're, we're going to get some function times a Gaussian. But for the lowest function, the Hermite polynomial is 1, and all there is is the Gaussian. And so it says, oh, well, we found the lowest level. And we can normalize it. And uh, so let's start over here. So what we have found is psi min of x is equal to mu omega over pi h bar to the one fourth power e to the minus mu omega over 2 h bar x squared. Well, that's useful. We knew that. But this time, we got it out of a completely different path. And now we can get all higher v by a dagger, a dagger, etc. So remember, we don't care anything about what the function is. We just know that we can bring it in and get rid of it as, at will because what we want is the values of integrals involving that function and some operator. So but yeah, we can have all of those functions. And this is a way of generating all of the functions. And so if we wanted psi v, we would do a dagger the vth power divided by v dagger uh, v, v um, what do you call this, with an exclamation point, factorial, ha. So we apply this operator that raises us to high, at whatever level we want, uh, starting from this Gaussian at the bottom, and we have this normalization factor which cancels out the, fa the, the stuff that you get by applying AV. Okay, so now there's some more logic in my notes and I don't want to do that, but what we'd like to be able to show is that A dagger on psi V gives some constant 
and that this constant has some value. We're going to evaluate what it is. And similarly, A on psi V gives dV and some constant V, v minus a half. OK, we can derive those things. And uh, I'm, I'm not going to waste time deriving them. I'm going to just give you the values. But we already know that CV is square root of V plus a half, V plus 1, and dV. And you can see the derivation of my notes. I don't think going through them is going to be instructive. And that's just going to be V. OK, so now we have something that's wonderful, because everything you need to know about getting numbers concerning harmonic oscillator is obtained from these five equations. A dagger on psi v is v plus 1 square root of psi v plus 1. A on psi v is v square root of psi v minus 1. I've said this before, but you, you know th these are the most useful things you'll ever encounter. We have this thing called the number operator. And that number operator is a dagger hat a. And the number operator operating on psi v gives v psi v. And so that's a kind of benign operator that is, can suck up all sorts of factors of a dagger a, because uh, it, it just gives it a useful thing. And then we have a, a dagger. And this is 1. Well, you, you sort of know it's going to be 1, because a, a dagger it gives an increase. It gives v plus 1. And a, a, uh, and, and a uh, gives v, uh, v minus 1. So it's plus 1, not minus 1. And you, you know that. It's hardwired. OK. Well, I did it. I got to the point where it starts to get interesting. So we're going to be using this notation, a dagger and a, for all sorts of stuff. And one sort of thing is transition intensities and selection rules. So you have a harmonic oscillator. A harmonic oscillator is, say, a diatomic molecule, which is heteronuclear. And so as the molecule vibrates, you have a dipole moment, which is oscillating. And so any electric field, oscillating electric field, will grab a hold of that dipole moment and stretch or compress it especially if that field is in resonance with h bar omega. And I'm going to, I've got some beautiful uh, animations showing this, but we can't do that until we have time-dependent quantum mechanics. So we have a time-dependent radiation field, which is going to interact with the dipole associated with the vibrating molecule. And it's going to cause transitions. And so, we can write the operator, the quantum mechanical operator, that causes the transitions. This is the electric dipole moment operator as a function of coordinate. And we can do a power series expansion of this. And we have So we have mu0, the constant term, the first derivative of the dipole with respect to x, and the second derivative of the dipole with respect to x. And so we have the x cofactor and the x squared cofactor. And so this guy doesn't have any x on it. It's a constant. The only integrals involving
the only integrals are delta v, v prime, following the selection rule, delta v, v prime. So these integrals are zero unless v and v prime are the same. And that, that says, well, there's an oscillating field is going to do anything here to it. It's just going to leave it in the same vibrational level, but it might have an electric Stark effect, but that's something else. Okay, so, uh, so this term does nothing as far as vibration is concerned. This guy, which is A plus A dagger, has a selection rule delta V of plus and minus one. And this guy has a selection rule delta V of plus and minus two and zero. So if we're interested in the intensities of vibrational transitions, it says, well, this is the important term and it causes transitions, changing the vibrational quantum number by one, which is called the fundamental. This gives rise to overtones. So all of a sudden, we're, we're in real, real problem land where if we're looking at vibrational transitions in a molecule, that this enables us to calculate what's important or to say these are the intensities I measure and uh, uh, these are the, the first and second derivative of the dipole moment operator as a function of internuclear distance. Isn't that neat? Okay. Well, I've gone so fast. I'm uh, more, more or less at the end of my notes, but I can blather on for a while. So suppose you have some integral involving an operator and the vibrational wave function. So, so we have psi v star, some operator, psi v prime dx. And we'd like to know how to focus our energies. If we're very busy people, we don't want to evaluate integrals that come out to be zero. We'd like to just know. So if this operator is some function of x or function of p, we'd have a power series expansion of that operator. And we then know what the selection rules are. So usually you, you look at the operator and you find that it is a function, a, it's a linear quadratic a cubic function of x, the leading term is usually linear, bang, you have a delta v of plus one, selection rule. Or if someone has bothered to actually convert the operator to some form, uh, let's, uh, the operator. This, this might have uh, some form a dagger cubed times some constant. Okay, so if the operator looks like a dagger cubed, uh, we know that the selection rule is v to v plus 3, and we know that the matrix, the integral is v plus 1 times v plus 2 times v plus 3, square root of that, times the constant. So, there's a huge number of problems that instead of being pages and pages of algebra are just reduced to something that you can tell by inspection. So one of the, uh, the tricks is we have an operator like x squared or x cubed. What we want to do is write this in terms of uh, a squared a dagger squared, and maybe some combination of a dagger a. So we want to take the a dagger a's with the a a daggers and combine them using the commutation rule. And then we have expressed this in this maximally simple form. And then you just apply a squared, apply a dagger squared, and you apply this. And you've got the value of the integral. So if you're a busy person and you want to actually calculate stuff, you want to know 
how to reduce operators usually expressed as some power of the coordinate or the momentum into a sum of terms involving these organized products of A's and A daggers. And you're going to be absolutely shocked at how perturbation theory, which leads to basically all of the formulas in spectroscopy, it's an ugly theory, but it reduces everything to things that you can just write down at the speed of your pen or pencil. Uh, and, and that's a fantastic thing. So you can't do this with the particle in a box. You can't do this with a hydrogen atom. You can't do this with a rigid rotor. Well, you can do some of this with a rigid rotor. But the harmonic oscillator is so ubiquitous because every one-dimensional problem is harmonic at the bottom. And so you can use it, and then you can put in the corrections. But also, uh, uh, because you want to describe dynamics, you almost always use the harmonic oscillator because not only do you know the integrals, but you know there's only a few. Normally, you're going to be summing over an infinite number of quantum numbers. And that takes time. And it takes judgment to say, well, only certain of these are important. But for the harmonic oscillator, the sums are finite. All of these things are wonderful, and that's why whenever you look at a theory, you're going to discover that hidden in there is the harmonic oscillator approximation. Because then everything is doable in no effort. And sometimes when you look at a paper like that, it doesn't show you the intermediate steps because everybody knows what a harmonic oscillator does. And there's also a lot of insight because, you know, something like this, this is an odd symmetry term, this is an even symmetry term, and there are all sorts of things that have to do with are you conserving symmetry or changing symmetry? And sometimes there's, the issue is, how does the molecule spontaneously change symmetry by doing something, interacting with the field, or, or ha interacting with some feature of the potential surface? So this is a place where it's labor-saving and insight generating and it's really amazing. So maybe, you know, maybe I've bored you with this, but this is, you know, this is the beginning of almost every theory that you encounter, just because of the simplicity of the A's and A daggers. Okay, I'm done. Thank you.